So for today's session, we are going to introduce Open Government Partnership, OGP, and how the initiative can benefit its participants and also to support Malaysia in the participation process. So our aim for today is to outline OGP objective, criteria, and impacts, to introduce national action plan, presenting a possible timeline of OGP coordination and initiative, and also to build collaborative relationship and establishing mutual understanding and expectation on the OGP process. So, and also you guys can read the code of conduct that we shared here. So for today's webinar, we will have four speakers with us, which are Tyrell from Sina Project to update on what Sina Project is doing currently on OGP. Ivy from Open Government partnership and she'll be talking about the OGP as a whole and the process. Terrin Davis from UK Government Digital Services, Global Digital Marketplace Program, GDMP, and she'll be presenting on their current project with the government of Selangor and Penang around digital procurement. And also Bernadine Ferns from the Open Contracting Partnership, OCP, She'll be talking about open contracting and open government partnership with some examples. Now we, I think we can just start with IV now. So you, you may may start your presentation. Thank you, Hafsa. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Sinar Project, for organizing this uh, webinar. The Open Government Partnership, or OGP, has a simple but powerful goal that governments should truly serve and empower their citizens. OGP's vision is that governments become more transparent, more accountable, and more responsive to their own citizens, improving the quality of governance and services that citizens receive. OGP was formally launched on September 20, 2011, the margins of the UN General Assembly, when eight founding governments, including Indonesia and the Philippines from Asia, as well as nine civil society organizations endorsed the Open Government Declaration and announced their country action plans. So there, I think we can now see. Uh, you can proceed to the next slide, please. Since 2011, OGP has grown to a partnership of 78 countries, a growing number of local governments, thousands of civil society organizations who come together to address the most pressing governance challenges faced by their respective countries. So OGP brings together domestic champions of reform in government and civil society who recognize that governments are much more likely to be effective and credible if they open their doors to public input and oversight and collaborate with stakeholders outside government. In the next slide, you'll see how OGP works. OGP signed off at the head of state level, meaning you will have the political cover you need to work on your goals. Often, the political will is there, but the knowledge or know-how on how to go from policy to practice is missing. OGP creates that safe space for government and civil society to partner for progress. But at the core of OGP is the platform for domestic dialogue between government and civil society and sometimes the private sector to co-create a set of contextualized open government commitments that are locked down in two-year action plans. These are homegrown reforms and not top-down imposed. So the dialogue helps governments gain trust and buy in for their reforms. And the high-level political backing gives the process momentum and more often than not, it helps unblock challenges. What do I want to emphasize here? It's citizens at the heart of government, the heart of society. You provide opportunities for citizen input and oversight, then you create more effective, efficient, and credible government. So I'd like to direct your attention to the rightmost part on the independent reporting mechanism. So the progress of each country, both on the delivery of the commitments and on the quality and depth of the collaboration, is independently evaluated by the Independent Reporting Mechanism, or the IRM. By publicly sharing country progress and challenges, UGP provides credibility and visibility to the reforms. 
So what makes OGP different is this domestically owned process. We are not a standard setting body, but it's a domestically owned mechanism to provide each country a, the space to work with where they are while pushing for a race to the top. In the next slide, it just shows you that visual of what it means to be a participating member of OGP. So if you notice, there is a section there where it's called eligibility. So prior to joining, a country will have to check its eligibility scores. The core eligibility criteria are the four that you see budget transparency, access to information, asset disclosure, and citizen participation. If you check Malaysia's score, it's not yet at the rate where it should be, where it can be eligible. I think we can talk more about that. Maybe Kyril will talk more about that later on uh, and what can be done. But once you have those scores as eligible, then you go through what I just mentioned earlier. You, government and civil society, agree to co-create a time-bound action plan, a two-year action plan. And then throughout this process where they, I, they co-implement or there is a division of OCSOs who would uh, provide oversight, monitor, etc. There is what we call the OGP participa participation and co-creation standards that needs to be followed that allows uh, CSOs to be engaged through the process. So the standards that I talked about are to ensure that there are baseline practices for all OGP participating countries that relate to disseminating of information that's related to the process. Uh, it also relates to spaces for dialogue and co-creation. Because once you become an OGP participating country, you're also expected to form a multi-stakeholder forum where it is chaired by government and co-chaired by civil society. So the MSF uh, serves as a permanent mechanism for ongoing consultations with civil society and ensures that there will always be opportunities for public input. This MSF, this multi-stakeholder forum, is selected transparently as well, and they report publicly to other CSO stakeholders. So what's the crux of it? Dialogue, action, monitoring. So the ambition is really to change the culture of government. And one thing that also draws a lot of participating countries is the international dimension to it. I mentioned that there are 78 countries. More often than not, these countries uh, are provided with peer learning, inspiration, and support from their peers. There's also peer pressure to do better because of what they see and what they learn from other countries and other CSOs even. OGV becomes a platform to turn these global conversations, even on SDGs, into domestic action through these action plans. So in the next slide, uh, I just want to mention that at the end of it, and it, I think it's becoming clear as well to you, it's that open government is defi by definition a big canvas. It's an approach more than a policy area. Any country is free to make choices about what they will focus on. So far, the key trends across the partnership when it comes to thematic areas uh, include citizens shaping public services, anti-corruption, access to justice, digital governance, and inclusion. Among the participating countries in Asia Pacific, public services and citizen, uh, citizen shaping public services and open contracting continue to be popular policy areas. Other fast growing areas include uh, SDGs, gender, and beneficial ownership. So let me share two stories first to ground what we see in OGP. In Mongolia, as residents of one of the most sparsely populated places on earth, one in three Mongolians are partially nomadic. Many citizens do not know which public services are available, much less how to influence how they work. So what did they do? In 2015, one of their OGP commitments was to ensure systematic dissemination of access to information on school performance and health services at the community level. What the Mongolian government did was they focused on 10 provinces with high rates of poverty, they sought citizen feedback on quality care in health clinics and school performance. At the same time, they partnered with local nonprofits so that they could train, 
citizens, educators, health workers, businesses, and public officials so that they could teach them how to enlist citizens to report on public services. At the same time, these government agencies also made strides in using the pu public feedback to address problems. One of the early successes that we saw in Mongolia was when trainees looked at medical procurement in their community, they were able to identify savings that was equivalent to 10% of the health budget. When the community activists discovered thousands of residents were being cut out of healthcare, they were able to quickly rectify that situation. Healthcare satisfaction then shot up by 20, 28%. The, this next story is from Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, they committed to create a robust right to information infrastructure with the goal of reducing government corruption. So they created a right to information commission to ensure that citizens' requests are addressed efficiently. So what they did was they undertook these mass trainings for public servants so that they could guarantee that the new commission could function properly. The interesting side effect here is that even when people don't always get information, they are still getting solutions to their day-to-day -day problems because the civil servants were feeling the pressure to address service delivery issues that were coming in through those right-to-information requests. The law was also being used by journalists in the local media. So in the next uh, slide, sorry, you can go to the next one as well. I wanted to focus on what OGP is doing now in this new situation that we find ourselves in, in COVID. So the Open Response and Open Recovery Campaign is uh, the partnership being cognizant that in this time, collective action of citizens, civil society, governments, private sector, other sectors of society, we all have to respond and recover from this pandemic. We launched this to ensure that those fundamental values that the partnership espouses, accountability, transparency, inclusivity, and responsiveness, that they remain at the forefront as we move through response recovery and eventually to a longer term reimagining of how governments will serve its citizens. We were also inspired by over 200 COVID-19 related examples that we crowdsourced from the world in recent weeks. This new campaign aims to bring together the reformers in civil society and government so that we could crowdsource, discuss, and share open government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've also been talking to a lot of our partners so that we could align and share the approaches and resources that we can all draw from. So in the next slide, uh, I just want to mention that there is uh, a site, in a page in our website where you can access guidance to how you can actually do something about this situation using open government approaches. And because of the help of our, through the help of our partners and friends in the community, they have emphasized that when it comes to or the importance of open response, it's your combination of, oh, mobilize open data so that you can assist frontliners, keep the public informed across, ensure emergency procurement is fast and effective and doesn't spur corruption. Then you also have open recovery where you need to make sure that there's oversight and accountability for stimulus funds, etc. And then when, if you go to this site, there are also policy guides that was co-created with a lot of our partners. Uh, and the guides will provide you with more specific recommendations and examples based on a thematic area that you think would be important for your context. So for us, it's really going beyond awareness of the good work that is happening across the world when it comes to OpenGov and responding to the pandemic. It's really about setting the stage for a longer term governance reform that can build more resilient societies. So I just want to end the, the presentation with the reality that now more than ever, the relevance of a government that truly serves and listens to citizens is 
stronger. Uh, and the powerful role of citizens have in working with their governments to tackle society's biggest challenges now comes at the forefront. And it's actually more important now in this situation. Okay, thank you, Ivy. And next, uh, we will have Taryn to present her input. You, you may start now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And um, also would like to say my thanks for putting this uh, webinar together. Um, so my name is Taryn Davis, and I am a senior project advisor with Development Gateway. And I'm going to be talking about a project we are doing with the Global Digital Marketplace Program that is based in the UK um, with the UK Government Digital Services um, Department. So um, just to give a bit of background about the Global Digital Marketplace Program. So like I mentioned, this is run by the UK GDS, so Government Digital Services, and they are working in five countries, which include Malaysia, to share experiences, lessons learned, and their lessons learned from improving digital procurement processes and procurement of digital services in order to improve efficiency, increase value for money, reduce opportunities for corruption, and improve domestic markets and supply chains. And within Malaysia, they are working both at the national level, but then again at the state level in Penang and Selangor. Um, and we were contracted to support the work they are doing in Selangor and Penang. Um, Development Gateway is a nonprofit organization, and we help create products that help institutions collect and analyze information, strengthen capacity to use data, explore what incentives, structures, and processes are needed to enable evidence-based decisions. And we do that at local, national, and global levels. We are um, working for this project. So as I mentioned, we are focusing on Selangor and Penang. Um, we conducted a discovery, and the goal of this discovery was to understand the entire procurement process within each of those states, and including the political and, and economic context um, that, that plays into their procurement process. Um, we were also aiming to understand what the main challenges and barriers to entry within their digital procurement and e-procurement processes, and then identify areas for opportunity where GDS could provide support and strengthen their digital procurement process. Um, and GDS is focused on five pillars, as you can see in this diagram to the right. So their five pillars um, include assuring plans before money is spent, designing procurements and contracts, assuring service delivery, oops, um, building capacity, building capability and capacity, and then publishing open contracting data. So we were kind of focused on these five areas and how GDS might be able to kind of share some of the practices that have helped them in these areas um, within Selangor and Penang. So a kind of a, a timeline of, of what we've done so far and where we're going. Um, so GDMP initially met with um, Selangor and Penang in um, fall of last year to kind of gauge their interest and to identify stakeholders that would be interested in, in working on this. Um, and that, that went well and they were interested. And so um, we started this work um, early this year. So we started um, just kind of with desk research in January to, to understand you know, what is the, the publicly available information on their procurement policies, legislation, um, digital tools, and who the key players are within their procurement processes. Um, and then at the end of February and early March, we actually went to each of those states. So I was in Selangor with my colleague for two weeks conducting interviews. And my, my other colleagues were in Penang early March to conduct um, interviews there to, to fully understand again that, that full procurement process, what any possible uh, challenges were and opportunities for GDS to support. So we are we're in this first um, report, first draft phase right now. So we're finalizing our first drafts of the report, <clears throat> which has been shared with, with GDS. And then eventually we'll move to um, kind of this remote validation. Originally it was supposed to be an in-person validation and um, we're kind of trying to 
as, as everyone is, kind of be flexible on that and figure out how to kind of go back and kind of fine tune our findings and our recommendations and prioritize those recommendations. Um, and then turn that into a final report, um, which will be shared with GDS. Um, and GDS will kind of use that report and this workshop to identify specific recommendations that they'll, they will actually implement with um, each of the state governments to, to kind of support, give, provide that support for um, kind of unblocking those barriers. Oh, there we go. So in Selangor, the interviews we conducted, we were able to meet with the state treasury, state ICT members, um, state agencies, so public private agencies, uh, local city councils, um, and we met with you know, buyers for procurement, IT staff, uh, contract and legal teams, and as well as tender board members. We were also able to meet with two IT suppliers who have had experience contracting with the Selangor State Government to kind of get their perspective of the procurement process and, and um, what they see are challenges within um, or barriers to entry within uh, the procurement process and then um, a CS CSO as well. Uh, in Penang, our, our team was able to meet with the Penang finance team, the IT team, Penang planning, Penang treasury, um, Serang Parai city council, as well as Penang Island city council, two state agencies, and four CSOs through, through surveys. They weren't able to meet them in person while they were there, as well as two IT suppliers. Okay, so our current status, like I mentioned, we are drafting our reports and our, our findings, um, which are being reviewed by GDS, and then we are planning on sharing those with the state governments that we have been working with for their feedback and review. And then, like I said, our, our goal is to kind of re-meet with several of those stakeholders, as well as potentially include um, other stakeholders we weren't able to meet with while we were there to kind of verify the accuracy of what we found, make sure that, that we understood correctly, uh, prioritize those recommendations and kind of dive deeper into those and to see how those would actually be implemented if, if they were to, to be carried out. Um, like I said, we are, are looking into seeing how we can do at least part of that remotely, um, seeing if we can kind of extend our, our timelines and, and shift that to see if it's possible in, in the future to be able to do any of that in person, um, but trying, again, trying to be flexible. So this is kind of um, our, our status so far, and I'm happy to answer questions. And I know um, some of the uh, GDMP colleagues are, are on the call as well to, to answer any other questions from their perspective. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Karen. So Benedin, you are up next. You may start now. Thanks, Hatha. Okay. Great. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Bernadine Burns. Everyone calls me Ben. I'm the Global Head of Infrastructure for the Open Contracting Partnership, and I'm also the Regional Head of Asia. So I'm really delighted to be here. Thanks again, Tyler, for inviting me. Some of you already know that we've been working with various agencies in Malaysia, including Mampu and, and several CSOs, for some time now, and we're really eager to identify the next steps for how we can continue to support this important open government work. So this conversation I find is, is very timely indeed. So you've heard all about the open government partnership and uh, how it works and about NAPs and things like that from Ivy and uh, OGP are great friends and allies of ours. So I'd love to take the next 15 minutes to talk you through how open contracting fits into the OGP realm. So in a nutshell, open contracting is fast becoming a global norm. It's been endorsed by G20 through its uh, various, various different mechanisms, but including the anti-corruption open data principles, the principles for promoting integrity in public procurement. Uh, most recently last year, the compendium of good practices for infrastructure, uh, amongst other things. And of course, uh, Open contracting also complements other global initiatives such as the ITI, uh, Cost Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, and, and other things like, uh, like that. So it's very much a complementary initiative that works to enforce and strengthen uh, all of the great work that's going on in, in the world and not to duplicate those efforts. 
more importantly for the purposes of today's webinar, open contracting is one of the most common policy areas for OGPP commitment. As of March 2019, there have been 189 open contracting commitments in the National Action Plan um, that I mentioned earlier on. So over 70 OGP members, uh, including Australia, Canada, France, uh, the United Kingdom, and USA, um, also Ukraine, Colombia, Honduras, to name a few, have made at least one open contracting commitment. So that's almost three quarters of all OGP members. And out of those members who have made uh, open contracting commitments, 55% of those commitments have been substantially completed. And more importantly, two out of every five open contracting commitments, that's over 40% of those open contracting commitments, are delivering significant improvements. They have significantly opened up government. And this is more than double the rate of success uh, of commitments overall. So I think this is something that as a key message is that open contracting can help deliver on open government goals. It can help deliver on your OGP um, broader aspirations. But what, what is open contracting? What, what is this all about? So open contracting transforms public procurement so that it is open by design, it's fair, it's efficient. Open contracting is about working with governments, with businesses, with civil society to deliver better value for money, improve efficiency, enhance competition, and build trust. At its core, open contracting is about publishing and using open, accessible, timely data on government contracting so that we can engage all the different stakeholders to identify and fix problems. And which important of all, it's important to mention that open contracting takes you throughout the entire life cycle and value chain of procurement, all the way from planning to tenders, awards, implementation, et cetera. And ultimately, open contracting helps you to deliver better goods, services, and public works to governments, businesses, citizens, and, and everyone. But why, why is this so important? So before, before I jump into some examples of OGP commitments, I think it's important to share some context about why this is so important. Now, every year, governments spend huge sums of money through public contracts, from everything from pencils and paper to building major infrastructure projects such as hospitals, airports, and schools. Now, that, that spending amounts to over $9.5 trillion every year. That's a massive 15% of global GDP. And one out of three dollars spent by government is spent on government contracting. So that's a pile of one dollar notes stretching from the earth to the moon and back. Obviously a huge amount of money. But we also know that procurement is government's number one corruption risk. We know that only 60% of foreign bribery cases heard at the OECD involve bribes for public contracts. And 30% of companies trust that corruption prevented them from winning contracts in the EU. But it's also not always corruption. It's just as often incompetence, mismanagement, inefficiency that gets in the way of delivering benefits to citizens. In this photograph, for example, this is a real photograph, and it's not made up. It's from a public project in a Lithuanian school. So when you look at it, you can immediately see that there are some clear problems here. There are no stalls, there are no cubicles, there are no doors, there are no sinks. Um, and most important of all, it was meant to be a girl's changing room. So what this shows us is that often it's poor coordination, mismanagement that gets in the way of delivering on delivering on projects, delivering on contracts. So what we need to do is to find ways to reduce mismanagement and waste and to improve efficiency and prevent this type of leakage. And this is where open contracting comes in. So open contracting, as I said before, is all about helping OGP members deliver good services and works by enabling the full life cycle of open government reforms. So going from data publication to data use, to identification of solutions, implementation of reforms to impact. So how do we do this? Our starting point for doing this is through our global non proprietary standards. So these are structured to reflect 
the complete contracting cycle through the open contracting data standard, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And it's structured to reflect both the project and contracting cycle for the open contracting infrastructure data standard. And these data standards enable users and partners around the world to publish shareable, reusable, machine readable data to join up that data with different data sets with your own information so you can create tools to analyze or share that data. And then the next slide, you'll see a visual of what the open contracting data standard looks like across the procurement chain. So you'll see that it takes you right across the full chain of government deal making, starting from um, planning stage to tenders, awards, implementation, etc. And in this slide, it will give you some examples of what data you might find at each stage. And I won't go through them in detail. Uh, it's really just to give you an idea. And I expect that these uh, slides will be circulated after the webinar as well. And then next, I want to share with you the Open Contracting for Infrastructure Data Standard. Now, this data standard builds on the OCDS to enable a tailored approach for regular disclosure, structured, standardized data, and infrastructure projects and contracts. And infrastructure projects, as you know, are very complex. So the OC Prize, yes, helps to connect projects and contracts so that you can have a more comprehensive, holistic view of how projects are performing as a whole and not at the individual contract level alone. So this helps to enable better monitoring of infrastructure projects. But what does this all mean? What this means is that it can let you go from something like this, and again, this is a real example, a real photograph from a procurement office in Ukraine under the Soviet procurement system, and it can help you go from something like this to something like this. And this is a state-of-the-art award-winning procurement system called Brazil. And the Ukraine, you might know, has made various commitments to open contracting uh, through the National Action Plan. And following through that process, they implemented this, this e-procurement system called Brazil. Now, from, it, uh, from its implementation, the Ukraine made savings of over a billion dollars uh, in the first year. Thousands of new suppliers flooded the market, and corruption perception also halved. More importantly, CSM monitoring was also embedded as part of these reforms. So a platform called Dezora was launched to enable effective citizen feedback and monitoring. And in 2018, this was awarded a star status. It was an OGP star reform. And what happened through the Dezora platform was that essentially 700,000 users so far um, have used the system and they've flagged nearly 74,000 concerns, of which 20,000 were found to relate to actual violations. And the good news is that from this feedback loop, from this um, citizen feedback uh, initiative, uh, we, they were able to get a 50% fixed rate, which is a really, really good um, indicator. Now, on this next slide, I'll talk you through another example of open contracting initiatives uh, that aligned with the OGP um, initiative. So, Colombia also has made commitment to open contracting and the open contracting data standard. And this is one of my favorite examples as this, this work in Colombia helped to deliver school meals to children in Bogota. What they discovered when they were implementing open contracting reforms was that firstly school meals in Bogota were grossly overpriced. Uh, there were schools that were paying almost 40 US dollars for chicken drumsticks. That was five times more expensive than the Michelin star restaurant in the, in the city. But also more importantly, a lot of those school meals weren't actually being delivered. They'd been paid for and they weren't delivered and children were going hungry. Now, through the reform process, looking at the data, what they were able to discover was that a huge part of this problem was uh, found in the way that contracts were being bundled together. The suppliers had to not only produce the food, fruits, vegetables, bananas, whatever, but they also had to distribute it to the schools. And many suppliers could only do one or the other. And so because of the way the contracts were bundled up, they were effectively excluded from participating. So what they did was that they effectively unbundled the contracts and also introduced a matchmaking process that enabled uh, suppliers to participate in, in the school meals program. And as a result of that, there were vast improvements um, to the delivery of school meals. The number of suppliers quadrupled, um, and 
ultimately there was an improvement in the food quality and food delivery. In this next example, I want to talk very quickly about how open contracting and working with OGP NEPs are also pushing the, boat, pushing the boat out even further to help deliver the sustainable development goals. So what they did here in Honduras, again, there were several open contracting and OCDF commitments in the NEP, and through that, they built on open data and OCDF and OC4 IDF data particularly uh, to develop a prototype. Here it's a user-friendly tool that helped the government to join up a project to infrastructure project planning and procurement data with environmental data so that they could better identify and assess what the risk to the environment was and particularly to prevent deforestation. So you can see in this map here that there's some uh, red zones for where those carbon projects exist. Now I'm just going to talk very quickly um, in these next two slides about what makes for effective open contracting commitments. So open contracting commitments in your OGP National Action Plan should include three things. The first is implement the open contracting data standards, OCDS, and or the open contracting for infrastructure data standards, OC for IDS, and that should span across the full procurement process, as I mentioned before. The second is to make all contracts open by design and publish them in a single online registry. And finally, and this is really, really important, is to develop and implement mechanisms for consultation and independent monitoring so that citizens, civil society, media, businesses, um, and also government agencies um, can fully participate in the public procurement process. Now, in closing, I'll just talk very quickly about what this means for Malaysia. Now, we heard early on that Malaysia don't yet uh, meet the threshold for joining uh, OGP, but there is good news because there is actually a lot of really great work that's always going on in Malaysia, and Malaysia is well placed to take the next step towards um, achieving OGP membership, uh, but the time really to act is now. And the reason I'm saying that is because uh, we have been doing, as I said, a lot of work with um, some good folks in Malaysia, and two things really, like two tools that I want to showcase really working together with Mampu. Um, the first is a, a red flag to a better competition tool uh, called Cartology, and, and the second is an infrastructure planning tool. So in this slide, um, this is essentially a red flag tool that was developed by one of the teams at Mampu to help um, identify some red flags at the tender stages, to help identify potential collusion before contracts are awarded. So essentially, they joined up procurement data with beneficial ownership data and there's other data sets to create algorithms to identify potential collusion. And this team won the open contracting uh, presidential hackathon last year. So it's really done really very well um, in, in, in the global open contracting arena. The next example uh, takes us through to the uh, MAS team, which developed a prototype called Buildcaster. And it's an infrastructure planning to, to help the government identify by the optimal locations for schools and hospitals based on citizens' needs. So the idea is to join up procurement data with capacity data, um, other standards data in terms of health and educational provision, uh, population data and things like that, to ensure that um, schools and hospitals are built in the areas that need them the most. So as I said before, there's already a lot of really good work going on in Malaysia, and we need to capitalize on that um, so that we can push ahead with open government reforms and OGP membership but action really is needed to um, fulfill all of the criteria for OGP so that we, uh, we can get over that final threshold. So I'm not going to say much on, on this slide because I think IBS uh, covered it really so well already in her presentation, um, but it's really, in case any of you want to read it in your own time, um, it's uh, some advice and some guidance for um, how open contracting uh, for open response and recovery, recovery through the OGP process uh, can be done. And finally, in this last slide, um, hopefully once the slide is circulated, there are also some links to some key documents uh, that can help you on your OGP journey. So with that, um, thank you very much, and I hand back over to Asha. Okay, thank you, Ben. 
So before we move forward to Kyril, we have a question to Taryn. Uh, he asks, would the report make public once available? Yeah, so um, I can let Angus confirm this, but I think the expectation is that we aren't going to be publishing it um, just so that the state governments don't feel like we're you know, kind of throwing them under the bus or anything. That, that's definitely not the goal of this project. It's more to be very you know, collaborative and identifying areas that the project can work with them. Um, however, we will be conducting, again, our uh, validation process. And, and during that process, we'll be kind of including people um, to kind of review those recommendations and findings and, and include that in the final, final recommendations and going forward. Um, so I'm, I'm going to put my email in the chat box. And if you um, would like to kind of participate in that process as we're going forward, um, do feel free to, to reach out with me. Um, happy to, you know, anyone who's been, you know, working in that, that area in, in selling gore pinning, particularly, um, it'd be, you know, great to have your insights. So. Okay, thank you, Darren. So, Kyra, we can start with you now. Um, so, uh, so for me, um, uh, my talk is going to be a little bit on how we can participate um, based on all these ideas that we've had before. Um, so one of the things about um, trying to get greater participation um, in government and collaboration is that government is hard, it's complicated, it's huge. Um, so even within government agencies themselves um, and for us outside on civil society, it's really hard to know where can we work? Uh, how can we collaborate on some of the initiatives you know, that have been shared? How do we get it started? Um, and if you can see here, um, there's just so many different areas that um, you know, we can work in. And who do I talk to in these areas? Like uh, who's working in these areas? Um, and how can we collaborate with others? Um, so I'm just gonna share quickly here, just a kind of feedback loop um, that will include some of these other things in open government partnership that we're discuss. Um, so one of the things that usually starts with is, you know, um, quite often in civil society, we want to have access, you know, to the decision makers, um, who decides that a school is being built, um, who decides, uh, you know, a, a law is being enacted. Um, and usually this starts in this kind of feedback loop, it usually starts with the, the legislature. So either the state um, legislature or the parliament, that's where your MPs uh, or your elected representatives. Um, so if you're from the outside and general public, that's usually one of the best mechanisms that you can access um, in terms of getting your voice um, out and input. Um, and then the legislatures then work on budgets. Um, so the feedback that you provide them lead to the budgets that are created um, and the priorities for these budgets on what should be spent on. Um, is then um, negotiated with the different agencies. Um, and then the agencies will then, you know, issue contracts, uh, deliver services, um, and which finally reach to, you know, the communities and uh, whether it's business, um, other government uh, departments, um, and finally feedback from these communities, um, or even from other government agencies, such as through um, you know auditor general reports or um, work through civil societies or communities themselves complaining, um, either through government uh, mechanisms or through um, their elected representatives, goes back and it goes into a little loop. Um, so this is generally the entire process, but government is so huge, um, we need some sort of framework to. Um, to collaborate on these things. Um, and this is where kind of the OGP co-creation process um, and um, the national action plans that Ivy shared just now uh, provide a mechanism for it. Um, so one of the challenges uh, we've mentioned about you know, open data and transparency is that actually in terms of open data right now for Malaysia, we don't have much uh, and we don't have enough data um, to make decisions in a lot of key um, areas. Um, so it makes it hard 
to make effective policy and it's not, and the COVID situation now is actually making things even clearer. Uh, I mean, it's actually showing just how difficult this problem is. Uh, if we're going to do welfare aid, uh, how do we get it to the different communities? Um, what happens if they don't have income? Um, is there enough data from the taxation department? Uh, what happens if they're undocumented uh, migrants? What happens if they're unemployed? Uh, where are they? These are the sort of things now that make it even more important um, on why we need to have um, you know, open data and also collaboration because um, data is not enough within specific groups. Um, so one of the things that we hope um, to move forward um, um, af uh, from after this seminar is actually one is to share and make it uh, easily accessible. What are the different initiatives um, in Malaysia? Uh, but as we now have learned that uh, what are also the initiatives internationally um, when we participate in the Open Government Partnership um, into solving these solutions. So um, I'm not going to go through every one of them because we will be sharing uh, more detailed documents um, and a website. Uh, but uh, just to have a quick overview of just some of them. Uh, we do actually have a digital government services in Malaysia. Um, it's called My Government um, to provide um, a lot of the things that we need um, in terms of access to government services um, on online. Uh, we do have a public sector open data initiative. Um, ben has just shared already, and as well as Taryn, that um, there have been efforts already in terms of um, making procurement um, more transparent, both at the federal and state level. Um, there are several initiatives um, for working on health and data research, um, both within the medical uh, research community uh, for government, uh, but also in the academic field. Um, there are efforts in terms of providing digital education. Um, other civil partners, uh, um, such as uh, C4 um, and the Center for Independent Journalism, along with the Legal um, Services um, Department, um, are working on an FOI enactment. Uh, so that was one of the issues um, on Malaysia not being able to uh, be uh, eligible as the OGB uh, criteria. Um, and then there's also other civil society efforts in terms of improving asset declaration um, as well. So, and this is just the scra uh, scratching the surface of all the existing initiatives um, um, that are ongoing in Malaysia. Um, and the next point that I want to touch on is um, why, uh, so here's some more examples of, uh, sorry, uh, here's some more examples in terms of, you know, the uh, opportunities for collaboration. Um, and where um, where the key um, p uh, participants will be. So definitely will be our elected representatives. Um, so I've actually here given an example of a parliament. So having um, legislative data and parliamentary replies uh, and the work of our parliamentarians and legislators at state is extremely important because they bring um, our issues. So in this, making that these sort of concerns more accessible um, helps us um, provide feedback directly to policymakers and hold them accountable. Uh, we also need to uh, have access uh, to know who are the key government officers in re doing implementing reforms um, at all levels. We've shared um, from the previous speakers certain things like, you know, open contracting, um, but there are also a lot of other reformers um, uh, and innovators within the public service and we need to know uh, we need a process to identify them and to uh, work with them. Um, also uh, to, broad, to broaden civil society and community groups. Uh, so for those in Malaysia who are not familiar, um, let's say you're from an environmental group and you need to know more about how I can access um, these government officers um, or to share my priorities. Um, yeah, so open government partnership co-creation process creates these spaces um, for you to access um, these decision makers and key government officers. And of course, there's also businesses. And finally, um, we're not alone when, when we're part of the open government uh, partnership and community, um, international community. Um, we're able to tap 
into and connect with um, other governments. Um, if we want to, if we're from a government agency, uh, we can um, get connected to other um, elected representatives if we are MPs. And if we're civil society, um, we can connect with, you know, both um, international multilateral partners, but also our peers, let's say in Philippines or Indonesia, or sometimes even in another country, let's say um, other Commonwealth countries that are part of OGP, um, like such as Kenya or the UK or Canada. Um, and my final slide on this is um, about how these sort of collaborations are now even more important um, in terms of when uh, for COVID. Um, the National Action Plan is actually for two years. Um, and part of the collaboration um, internationally that's going on for open data right now is to collaborate on what are the key data sets that we need to make open um, in order to deliver public services better. Um, so this is just a snapshot. Um, um, so disease spread statistics, for example, um, it will all not only be, for example, by the Ministry of Health, but it's going to also be depending on state agencies. It's going to be uh, civil society groups um, all need to collaborate in terms of providing better um, statistics and data. Um, and we will be facing other issues that we have already seen, such as food and nutrition security. Um, given the likely hard economic impacts that are going to be coming, uh, that are already being faced by a lot of um, the, uh, by large segments of the population in, in Malaysia. Um, how do we ensure, for example, um, that um, children and people as well get enough nutrition? Where's the data to collect this? Um, who do we collaborate with? Um, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through every single point, but just an example for food and nutrition on why collaboration is so important. If we need to find out, for example, which children, um, like school going children, um, need support for welfare um, or food, we will actually get a lot of this detailed data from the schools or the Ministry of Education. Um, if we're looking for those that are, you know, uh, undocumented, for example, or you will need to get this data from, um, we will need to get this data in information and priority areas from civil societies, uh, from civil society and NGOs working in this area. Uh, if we need to look at in terms of the supply chain and logistics uh, of food delivery, we're going to be needing to work and collaborate with the private sector. Um, we're going to need to work with the agricultural sector and possibly even the international trade uh, ministry and those involved in that area um, to ensure that there's enough food supply. Um, so just on say food and nutrition security, it's not, uh, the problem is so large that we can't do this alone. Um, and it affects at all levels. So we need a mechanism to collaborate on it. Um, so moving forward on this, um, what we're gonna be planning, um, on this is with the support of the OGP support group um, is to actually begin a process um, for drafting our own national action plans uh, for Malaysia um, following the OGP process. And this is going to go on for the next few months um, until September. Um, and so if you, after the seminar, if you've seen, um, um, if you are interested or you know people who are interested to be part of this, uh, whether it's in government, private sector, or civil society, um, do connect with us. Um, you can follow our social uh, media um, uh, accounts, um, CNR Project on Twitter or uh, CNR Project at Facebook, uh, or you can email us. Um, within uh, a, week, a week from now, we will be actually uh, launching a website that will include all the initiatives that we know, as well as updates on what's happening, um, and the next steps in the process on on how we uh, on creating and drafting this national action plan uh, for Malaysians. Um, and this coordination is for everyone. Um, so, um, so part of this. Um, part of the coordination on the website as well as, as through the mailing list that we will be doing is to make sure that 
to get as many um, participants and, um, and people representing the different um, efforts and initiatives online and to also provide a space um, uh, for awareness on what each of these initiatives are doing um, to enable um, collaboration um, and the development of this national action plan moving forward. So yeah, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Karel. So we have a question here in the chat room, few questions. So I think I'll start with the Gayatri question. She said that the main challenge to open contracting is the associated political patronage and where political ambitions are tied closely to contract. Where have you seen a good transition from a more patronage based political background to one that supports open contracting? This is a question to Ben. So Ben have uh, already answered here in the chat room. So I, I can add more colors. That's useful. Uh, okay. So maybe <laughs> you want to add. Yep. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I think this is a, a great question, guys. Three, and I, I think you're you're like absolutely bang on the money. Um, this is something that we've been very actively working on. Uh, we have a whole bunch of partners, including Open Ownership and Open Ops, that we're working with uh, to to address these issues. The, the short answer is that this is something that, that, that's necessary everywhere, right? So I think very often um, people think that just because, um, you know, there are maybe more developed countries uh, across the world that these sorts of things don't happen there. But let me tell you that they do. Um, in the UK, uh, just a couple of years ago, we had a huge um, clash of a, of a large, uh, you know, the largest construction company called Carillion here. And there were questions there about why they were still being awarded contracts, even though uh, they were very much in the red uh, and they had various uh, various accounting um, red flags. Um, so that's that's something that's ongoing, as I, as I said. Um, I've put some links in the chat on, you know, how open contracting and beneficial ownership and, and what what the progress and 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 process is there, which uh, you know hopefully will give you more color. Um, one of the key things is really about creating a, a register um, of companies so that you can really track um, how and and who is actually winning contracts, and it's not just one person who owns. 10 different companies constantly winning uh, contracts and, and creating the, the, the sense that uh, you know, things are, are fair and equitable when in fact it isn't. Um, and then the other thing that I want to draw your attention to also is that Karel's um, work here in the Tillis project through um, Kina project is also something that's particularly relevant in the Malaysian context. Um, so I don't know if maybe Karel, you want to say more about that because I don't want to put words into your mouth. <laughs> Yeah. So in terms of that, um, in terms of patronage, um, so for contracts, um, the the best way in terms of open contracting is to actually be able to publish these sort of information um, and get access um, to who is actually getting the contracts. Um, so um, as we've also seen from Mampu as well, is that um, when we have um, the data, um, even if it's internally. Um, the data will be able to actually provide mechanisms for when there's collusion, um, for when there are people who are uh, politically exposed persons are getting contracts. Um, so uh, we do have really good processes in place in Malaysia. Um, so other than the direct negotiated contracts for which we can also see what percentage there is, um, having this um, you know, open contracting process and having the tools within government um, is already, we're already seeing progress here in terms of being able to, um, able to see uh, if there's any sort of collusion or um, involvement of politically exposed persons in contracts. Um, yeah. Okay, Thanks, so, Karen. yeah. So for this one, also for Ben as well, on SMEs in Malaysia, so you have answered also here. So if you would like to like, uh, I, I can share for the yep. benefit of others. Thank you. Yep, yep. Okay. So uh, again, another great question. And I guess the key is, is essentially what Kyrill has said that with data will be empowered to understand what's working and what's not. And really open contracting is designed to level the playing field and create fairer opportunities for businesses, including SMEs. 
so the idea is that um, if we know who's winning contracts, we can then see what, whether or not procurement is working for everyone, right? So if it's only large companies that's winning contracts, and if it's a goal, um, if it's government policy, or economic policy to create more opportunities for SMEs or or indigenous businesses, for example, or uh, women-owned businesses, or to create other kind of uh, um, gender equity or uh, yeah, uh, more inclusion and diversity in the way that contracts are being awarded, then that's something that open contracting can help with um, using the data. So I gave a couple of examples there. Uh, for example, in the Ukraine, the open contracting approach has greatly increased SME participation. And in fact, some 80% of government contracts now go to SME. Um, similarly, in Colombia, the example I mentioned with school meals earlier, so the number of suppliers quadrupled um, through that school meals program, mainly because the contracts were unbundled, right? So because the local government saw that, the, that there was an issue with the way that the contracts were, um, were being tendered, that they were too large and, and too complex for some of the smaller businesses to participate. And because of that, they unbundled the contracts uh, and then through that, this, these small businesses were, were more able um, to participate and, and to, 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 to win contracts. So those are some examples in, 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 in how open contracting can help level the playing field and create more opportunities. Um, also, I mentioned in the chat that uh, half of all contractors that won government bids under the more open procurement system in Colombia in 2015 had actually never participated in public contracting before. So again, it's, it's helping to show that um, there, it opens up sort of new realms of possibility in contracting. Okay, so I think Gayatri has uh, more questions to ask Ben. So Gayatri, you can start now. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll try not to uh, burden and ask more questions. It was just uh, just to clarify. Thank you very much also for sharing the links. I'm, I'm reading through the examples. They're really quite um, uh, inspiring in that sense. And maybe just to contextualize a bit uh, for Malaysia, I think um, uh, Kyril definitely with the Sinar is doing an excellent job to put out a lot of this information. Um, in, the, in, the, in, in the sense of, um, I think the problem here could be that um, there are other layers of uh, sort of uh, interest that comes in um, because of the way the politics is, is actually shaped. Um, I guess it could be where once we know who actually gets the contract, are we bothered enough? So this is the cultural and political mind, uh, mindset shift to say, well, that is problematic because we do have a lot of influence of uh, sort of group-based identities that also influence and justify the way in which some of these contracts are given. So one element of it is to create the processes to say, look, you know, it has to be open. It has to uh, demonstrate the levels of um, uh, criteria, it, its fairness. Uh, but another also, there are other values that, that have come into play in awarding uh, these contracts. So um, I just wanted to share that as, um, you know, just looking at what the, the Malaysian contacts is. Uh, but thank you very much for sharing. I, I like, um, I'm just reading through the examples of Paraguay and, and see how um, you've had that shift. And I think the, the legislative shift is so important to really guarantee those processes because if it's only policy level, I think it will not be able to go very far and guarantee. So there needs to be that legal change at every level to support um, uh, that kinds of uh, processes. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Kyra, so very quickly, if I might respond to, oh, sorry, or, or Kyra okay, can go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do one of you, yeah. Okay, great. Maybe I'll start. So just responding to you guys, we, I absolutely hear you. Um, your so many pertinent points that you've made there. And um, again, if it's helpful at all, uh, these are also similar issues that we face in, in other locations where, where, where we operate. It's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do what we're doing. You know, there are lots of challenges along the way. Um, and creating that sort of behavioral change or organizational change and, and broader cultural shift is, is really key. So I think the first thing that I want to say is that open contracting doesn't start and end with the data. The data obviously helps us in the work that we need to do and it helps to inform us to define and identify the solutions that we need. But really there's a, a huge raft uh, of, of capacity building, uh, sensitization, of upskilling that we need to do um, across all stakeholder groups to 
really get people brought into the idea of open contact and how it helps them. So I think the idea is to really try and appeal to those demographics and, 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 and understand what, what, what is it that is their primary concern, right? So with SMEs who are, for example, not able to win contracts, well, we need to create an app, we need to create um, the evidence or show the evidence in terms of how this openness can help them. So if it's, for example, whether or not, um, the, you know, if certain groups, uh, ethnic groups or, or minority groups or, or majority groups are, are, are getting the contracts or, or, or the opportunities that have been promised to them, well, let the data, let the data look at that and, and show it as well. And then I, I also agree with you absolutely that um, in terms of reforms, the, the mandate, we really do need robust mandates, and that needs to come from the, from the highest level. And that's something that we do work on also at, at Open Contracting. Um, we do provide a lot of support in um, helping create that enabling environment for open contracting, whether that's um, through uh, helping uh, our partners uh, create legislation or regulations or something else, but also developing that whole ecosystem um, of getting from data publication to data use to uh, solutions, reforms, and impacts. And there's, there's a whole raft of different interventions, and we can take that offline, and I can, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that as well if that's helpful. I don't know, Tyrell, if there's anything that you want to add to that. Um, yeah, I, I just want to add here is, yeah, having so there's a lot of layers of uh, Malaysia. So one example, um, like from research of Professor Terence Gomez, and we're seeing now with the political appointments, is that um, beyond just government contracts in Malaysia, we will also see the involvement of GLCs um, and expenditures through GLCs, uh, which are government-linked companies. And that's at about 48% of just the public um, stock market, for example, in terms of a value and expenditure. Um, okay, so given this, you know, like uh, difficulties, even though we do work at the high level to get political buy-in, um, how do we change this? And this is also to answer Vincent questions, uh, Vincent's question. This is the part where the collaboration matters um, in where civil society can have a voice. Um, so if we, for example, we might not be able to know uh, who got awarded, let's say, a contract to reclaim land um, to build a uh, ocean resort. Um, what civil society can do here and, you know, um, in collaboration, for example, is that um, if, if civil society, if we can enable and help civil society understand, for example, let's say a local fisherman's group or um, a local farmer's group or, um, in, or, or concerned parents and teachers in an area, um, you can organize within these groups uh, to, to understand what should you have gotten um, and to work with either um, you know, um, elected representatives, uh, journalists, um, along with other international, uh, you know, or, or along with even local departments, for example, to understand, um, to understand issues that are affecting the local communities and hold them accountable. So if you're, um, let's just say for example there's supposed to be a contract to provide food for um, um, let's say poor students or uh, uh, for poor students at school um, and this contract is not public um, there are mechanisms such as doing social audits within the schools um, with you know parents and so on to organize and say okay um, what's the percentage um, in uh, of um, of people who are, are getting or not getting this. And this sort of accountability mechanisms um, with civil society um, and collaborating with others is one way that we can hold um, government accountable um, uh, and to, to, to hold you know, public service delivery accountable um, at the accountability level, even if we are not able to see you know, who are the players or the processes in the contracts that are being awarded. Okay, so we are moving to Michael's question. He asks, how close is Malaysia in getting FOI, national legislation? <laughs> so if anyone wants to answer that, maybe Kyra. <laughs> um, I, I can answer this uh, because I got some um, feedback. So for, um, 
this is um, actually the effort of um, Center for Independent Journalism, uh, CIJ. Um, a lot, I, I mentioned them earlier with um, C4 and the uh, Legal Services Department. Um, they've done work already in terms of development and drafting of this act. Uh, so the latest news on this is that the draft, um, given the past consultation workshop um, that was done a few months ago, is that the Legal Services Department um, will have a draft bill ready um, within a month or so. Um, um, that's on you know, the actual bill um, that's ready to be uh, 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 for feedback and to be tabled. Um, now, of course, uh, I and also the legal services department can't answer on whether this will be tabled or not, and that would be up to our um, present government. Okay, thank you. So we have a question uh, from Nalini. I think this is will be answered by Ivy. In the context of open government, is there a clash between privacy and transparency? So like to share yeah great question something that always came up especially when the partnership just started and Kyril has a huge smile on his face because we first met when we were working on open data I was still in government then uh, but yes very important question and I think the first thing to think about when we talk about uh, transparency and privacy is that it's two it's the two sides of the same coin if you view it from that way, then you also see that one, yes, open data or being transparent enables people to, you know, hold government to account, enables us and provides power to citizens as well to see uh, how services are being provided. Is it actually going to the hospital that I'm expecting it to go to, etc.? But at the same time, if you think from a privacy perspective, when you're democratizing information, open government says that it's all about constant communication with your citizens. So at the very end, it's all about if I have data privacy laws, if I have open data, while I'm disclosing information, citizens would feel and trust their government if in this spirit of transparency there will always be opportunities for one that they won't be personally identified by the information and if two there are items in that open data aspect that might be a gray area for example in in your country's privacy law uh, or regulation these conversations with government enables them to provide uh, input and provide experts that space so that they also flag any kind of privacy um, problems uh, that they come up with. So I think that's one, one thing that I wanted to, to share is that we have to go beyond this binary um, and actually go into, okay, um, how do we provide a framework that protects data rights, that protects privacy, but at the same time enables us to see and get information and analyze information that helps us live our life or helps us uh, hold government to account. Okay, so we have uh, Clara from COS here. She uh, also uh, sharing uh, on the question about the political patronage just now. So I think Clara would like to uh, explain more and share more to others on what have you been uh, sharing on the chat room. Oh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Yes, hi, this is Clara from COS, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative. So I think uh, Ben actually knows us very well. I think she also did mention us in her presentation. So I think um, specifically to the question on political patronage, I think uh, the idea is through open data, it does shine a light on the nature of the bidders and the successful bidders. So it's not so much that it's targeting specifically 
on uh, certain types of winners of uh, the successful bids, but I think more like to make sure that the entire process is more transparent. So, of course, there could also be really good reasons why certain companies do seem to win uh, these uh, awards uh, time and again. But I think maybe the idea is to also look backwards in terms of the nature of the bids, the way that they are actually crafted um, and whether they are designed in a way that would perhaps um, narrow the competition uh, in a un uh, perhaps unfair manner. So I think the idea is to work backwards um, and to also uh, break down on these. So I think that's where open data helps specifically. Okay, on the SME as well, you shared here, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think specifically, um, I wanted to give the example of Thailand because Thailand is a member of COST, uh, but it's not a member of OGP. So through the Comptroller General Department under the Ministry of Finance, uh, through the uh, data that, uh, that they have uh, based on the uh, successful bits of uh, infrastructure projects, they also did an analysis in terms of the size of the bits and the number of the bits. So I think uh, it's not surprising, uh, bits that are really huge, uh, it's not typical for SMEs to bid for them because sometimes it may be beyond their means. Uh, but you would see that certain sizes of packages would attract the most number of bids. So if governments are serious about SME development, this also helps them uh, craft their packages in a manner that would encourage uh, more companies, particularly SMEs, to bid for them. And I think conversely, for SMEs who are interested to participate in government bids, uh, by having an open data portal, that also helps them look out for types of bids, uh, of pro uh, types of projects that they could potentially bid for. And this also helps them prepare their own pipeline in terms of projects and what they could participate in. So I think this also allows SMEs to also invest in their own capacity building so that they know that they would put in, be able to put in fair competitive bids. Because if they know that the system is unfair, then there is no reason for them to actually invest in their own capacity. So I think it does, in the end of the day, help develop the entire sector. Okay. Yeah. Uh, happy to chat more about infrastructure, but we can take this offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think another session on that. Okay, so I think we've covered all the questions in the chat room. So if anyone else have any question, just raise your hand and we'll let you speak. We have another like 30 minutes on our time before we wrap up. I'd be quite interested. Hi, it's uh, Angus um, from the Global Digital Marketplace Program through so with Taryn. I'd be quite interested in hearing from the civil society organisations here how you would like to access data. So is it just you want an API which you can access, you just want the data to do your own thing with it? Um, do you want it in some kind of front-end um, website where you can look at it in an easily accessible way? What are your needs from government data? How do you want to access it? Does that question make sense? <laughs> Good. Uh, hi, uh, Michael here. Yeah, just to add, uh, I think uh, data here, even in our open data portal, you see it is not uh, have a lot of details. So instead of mm -hmm. aggregating, yeah, you really want to see the full details. So we can do the analysis that we need. Yeah, it feels like often incomplete data can be worse than, than no data um, sometimes. Yeah, unfortunately, Malaysia is covered under Official Secrets Act, so all documents, uh, even uh, those that are not really that secret, uh, you know, the uh, government can actually mark it as, uh, you know, uh, Official Secrets Act. And uh, so, legislatively, I think we are upside down in that sense. Okay, so Gayatri, you want to add anything? Yep, shoot now. Thank you. Um, oh wait, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so one question about um, the format of data, because a lot of this also presumes or uh, um, predicates on the availability date of data in a certain format. Um, I think um, in a lot of the 
uh, uh, communication that Karen has put out is also how the data is captured, whether it's text-based or uh, statistics and how it can actually be uh, used. But beyond that, there's also a lot of data if we think about uh, how societies are organized that are not necessarily in the formal structure that we are so used to. And I think decision-making, in fact, we need to think about decision-making on openness uh, that's not only led by this kind of very formal um, uh, data. So if you think about indigenous communities defending their land, mapping out their land, and also, um, you know, sort of like storing that information, which is not always sort of in the, um, in, in the way that we tend to process the data, right? So I'm just uh, uh, um, uh, raising this question about whether you've seen, you have encountered, you have recommend, uh, recommendations on how in order to improve these kinds of uh, openness, transparency, that we are also not necessarily only having a particular type of format of data that is usable, that is also sort of inclusive of the, the different ways in which people communicate, store and use data, uh, particularly if we think about the, the indigenous societies and also other communities. Thanks. That's a, that's a very great question. Uh, and interestingly, something in the Philippines is uh, cropped up as an OGP commitment around that. So um, there have been certain civil society organizations in the Philippines um, who are doing social audits, uh, particularly on education. Education is quite huge. There are a lot of, it's the biggest bureaucracy in the country uh, of uh, archipelago, archipelago with 7,200 islands. So you can imagine how much information you need to get from all these schools uh, so that you would know how service is, if they're getting their budgets, are they getting their books, etc. So what they've done uh, last year was they agreed that there would be some kind of data sharing agreement um, where the mashup of official data, meaning what is actually collected from within the bureaucracy and submitted to the headquarters uh, of the Department of Education, is actually merged with all of the social audit data that are collected by civil society organizations. And they actually focused on what they call the last mile schools. These are geographically displaced uh, schools. More often than not, these schools uh, are quite far from cities. Uh, and also, more often than not, they service um, indigenous peoples. So it was uh, an agreement basically being cognizant of what you just said, making sure that the information provides you a clearer picture uh, of actually what kind of quality of service is provided to a public school that is so far and from cities. Uh, and is it actually providing that service? So I think uh, we also have to um, be uh, capable of thinking that when it comes to open government reforms, it's not just about um, going into policy and transparency of data from within government, but again, going into what, where other government, uh, where other data sources can be. Uh, and that includes, you know, these third party monitors, if you will. Okay, so Kyra, do you want to add more on uh, Angus' question just now and add on the input from Michael? Um, what's up? That, okay, so I, I think I'm going to answer. So on Angus' question, um, I think we need more feedback from the SME community, but um, at least from a civil society viewpoint, um, when we're reviewing the data, um, um, the example that was shared by Manko was quite good because they had enough data to... Um, to see, for example, whether there was collusion um, or whether the same vendors were con constantly getting the same contracts again and again, you know, in an, an anti-competitive manner. Um, so one of the challenges that um, I've seen as civil society in terms of monitoring competitiveness um, is because of our decentralized nature of government in Malaysia, um, a lot of the publication on contract awards, um, um, not just contract awards, but also tender in terms of opportunities are actually spread out across um, dozens, um, if not more uh, government websites. 
um, and they're often also not archived. Um, so for example, you might only see the awards of the last three months um, given um, for, uh, for a particular agency. And then you'll have to repeat this process for every other agency uh, to be able to have a complete picture of um, you know, the level of competitiveness or even opportunities that are available for you. So um, there have been some intermediaries like companies which are collecting this kind of information um, and then uh, reselling it as a fee um, in terms of let's say a tender is available. Uh, but yeah, one challenge that at least for civil society for monitoring this is um, the lack of centralized data and the lack of quality data um, to be able to do such analysis. Um, um, I think there was another question on Gaia 3 on uh, missing data. Uh, I think this is the part where it's really important for civil society to be a part of. Um, uh, I mentioned the, the part before, like what data is actually, uh, so there's two levels here. One is the accessibility of these kind of complex uh, data. Um, and one, one approach that I've seen, I think um, open contracting is, uh, we'll have a webinar Ben just shared on low tech environments. Um, the other part is to, uh, for um, intermediary uh, CSOs to reduce um, some of these uh, standards um, into something that are much simpler. And um, an example for, a good example for this is actually COST, uh, which is the infrastructure transparency project. So at the high level, you know, infrastructure projects are way too complicated for, um, uh, for people like me to un even understand what are the implications for uh, my community or, um, or the environment. And um, um, one way that COS has been able to do that is to just basically have some, to simplify it down to just simple checklists uh, for things that journalists or communities can ask questions of. Um, so we might not have, you know, the data and detail stru uh, structured data, but we would have that data in terms of what kind of questions uh, communities can ask for that would, would be most important. Um, uh, and uh, just a final point on this is on missing data is, again, we need um, communities to be involved in. Um, an example is, uh, for example, addressing the digital divide in Malaysia. Um, we are missing uh, gender segregated data. Uh, um, so there's no way to tell in um, Malaysia for a lot of the digital divide issues uh, on who has actually access um, to the devices um, and in terms of just how many devices per household, which is more accurate and who has power um, for access to these, um, you know, uh, for digital access. Um, so again, community participation, which we hope to facilitate, will help to identify this missing data that needs to be in um, the standards that we develop. So, okay, we have a question here from Vincent. What about creating an independent watchdog to oversee the implementation of procurement so government can be held more accountable? So if anyone wants to answer that. Sorry, what was the question, Hashna? I couldn't, I couldn't hear it well. Oh, creating an independent watchdog to oversee the implementation of procurement so government can be held more accountable. I, I can say a few words. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think any of, oversight generally is, 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 a good, is a good idea, right? Um, and I think what we really need is getting from data publication to data use um, and independent watchdogs and whether it's a, a watchdog or other organizations is really important to make sure that that oversight is there. Um, we see a lot of this in Latin America, for example, where you have um, like called different things, usually a Contraloria or an Auditoria Social, where they essentially function as watchdogs or, or auditors in inverted commerce to, to monitor the performance of, and, and practices of government. And I think it, it works, obviously, if you have that independence, right? And, and the key is to, to ensure 
that you get that independence and that it's not uh, just an, yet another mechanism um, that is beholden to those that are, are being monitored. So I think that's, that's one thing that's really important. And the other thing also is that just because there is an oversight agency, um, it doesn't negate the need for civil society, um, civic tech groups, uh, the media, academia, to also play their part, right? Because it, it takes a village to make this work. Um, and we all need to be uh, making sure that we're holding um, decision makers and, and, and stakeholders who, 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 who spend public money to account. Um, I think there's, uh, in addition to that, there, there are lots of different ways in which we can create those partnerships. Um, you know, Ivy talked about a multi-stakeholder um, mechanism in, in, OGP, uh, in OGP work uh, that works also in the work that we do at Open Contracting, which is very much aligned to that. Um, if cost also has a multi-stakeholder function, um, and I think that you know that kind of check and balance makes it really, really effective because it's not just one institution or one stakeholder group doing the monitoring, and because it's everyone monitoring at the same time, you have to keep each other honest. And I think that you know in that way you have more integrity in the process, and you'll find also that you know in in in, in those countries where you know, some years ago where there was the Central American Spring. Um, where there was largely uh, a loss of confidence in the then government of the day. Uh, but these types of initiatives, costs and, and OGP, et cetera, you know, largely persevered because it wasn't, it wasn't perceived to be um, you know, just a, a government-only initiative. So um, I think this kind of multi-stakeholder um, cooperation and this collaboration is, is really, really important. Okay, so Ben here, you are sharing as well on your webinar on May 20th on open contracting in low-tech environment. So I think everyone yes, likes to join, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really timely question. So we are actually just hosting a, a learning circle on the 20th of May uh, on open contracting in low-tech environments. So please do register and sign up and come along to that. And you'll be able to meet other members of my team who've been doing a lot of work on specifically this issue. Okay, so if anyone has any question, yeah. You may. Uh, could I just chime in quickly? This is Clara from Cost. I just wanted to uh, quickly uh, speak about the independent watchdog. So I think I wanted to highlight because I think as uh, Ben mentioned, uh, Cost is a multi-stakeholder group. But as part of the Cost uh, initiative, we also have a process called the assurance process, and there is an assurance team that would actually do an independent review of the data. So Cost doesn't actually seek to replicate existing institutions. So for example, uh, the Auditor General's office would be the one looking into, um, I guess, uh, the functions of the government, including procurement. And there are also, of course, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission. So they, these would be the investigative body and as well as the uh, uh, public uh, prosecutor would actually uh, do the prosecution of charges. Uh, but what the cost uh, process does is actually do an independent review of the data that has been disclosed. And it shines a light in terms of whether there are any discrepancies missing data uh, and also some of the trends that have been uh, uh, analyzed. So in a way, it's a neutral body where they don't, act, they just let the facts speak for itself. But that of course raises perhaps some uncomfortable questions that the stakeholders may need to address. So I think this uh, is also part of the process where the idea is to strengthen existing institutions and not undermine it. So I think uh, that's actually how open data works. It's not there to uh, replace certain uh, bodies or to create new bodies, but really to strengthen existing processes. Okay, if anyone has any last question. <laughs> so if no, then I think uh, if any of the speakers would like to uh, mention any, any additional infos and to wrap uh, this webinar, you can yeah, share it now. 
Well, perhaps I could shamelessly plug um, an, <laughs> an no innovation worries, challenge yeah. <laughs> that, that we're, we're working on. So um, mm. you, you heard earlier during my presentation that there were two teams from Malaysia that um, did really well at an open contracting uh, presidential hackathon last year, uh, both from, from Mampu, so one with the Cartology project and the other mass team with Buildcaster. So both those teams um, participated in this presidential hackathon that we were organizing in collaboration with the presidency in Taiwan. They placed first and third respectively, and we're really excited about that. This year, we're running um, a, a similar event, another innovation challenge. The applications are open now, and I'll pop the link into the chat group shortly. Um, the theme for this year is how can open data in public procurement deliver on the sustainable development goals? And we're looking for teams to either generate and, anal and analyze open data or create prototypes uh, for open data uh, in public procurement uh, for SDGs. So we'd love um, to see some of you uh, represented there. So please do check out our page. Um, and yeah, if it's something that you're interested in, please do apply. We will also be having a, a webinar this Thursday at 8 a.m. And the team from Cartology will be presenting their prototype, uh, which, as I mentioned, is all about uh, red flagging for anti-corruption and fair competition. Um, it uses real data um, from Malaysia, and they created um, you know, a, a tool to help identify collusion and, and corruption at the tender stages. So if you're interested, you might be, you might want to come along to that as well. Okay, so Ivy, you, you shared the global report, so you want to elaborate on that? You may. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of things that you can see in the OGP website, but I, I'm just flagging on this latest one that I shared is that global report on open contracting. Ben referenced that uh, in her presentation earlier, but it gives you a, a snapshot uh, both of the examples as well as the frontiers. Uh, and of course, OCP would have, and cost, uh, would have a lot more to talk about around that one when it comes to what else is next when it comes to an ambitious open contracting commitment. Um, but beyond that, it's also the guide that I mentioned earlier. So those policy guides uh, around different kinds of thematic areas, so anti-corruption, um, access to justice, uh, fiscal transparency, etc. Uh, they're all in the OGP website on the open response and open recovery page. So yeah, um, please feel free to use uh, and um, make the most of it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will just drop my email in the chat. Uh, and I think Sinar will also be sharing our slides with my contacts there as well. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Yeah. So Taryn, if you want to uh, last word from your team, or you or Angus, yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just that, um, as I mentioned, we'll be doing our validation of a report and would, you know, love to include others in the community who've been working in selling and pinning to, to kind of verify what we found and, and feasibility of our recommendations. So please do reach out to me if you would like to be a part of that. If, if I know I pasted my email before, but if you want yep. me to, to repaste it, just let me know. So Kyril, do you want to wrap this webinar <laughs> for us? Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, thank you so much, um, you know, to IV, Taryn, and uh, Ben for uh, making time. Uh, for the others following the call, especially Malaysians, um, this we hope you know this is just an introduction um, to the international partnerships and resources that will that are will be available or. We, should, uh, we are available to us. And this is part of the reason that we wanted to introduce the OGP process, that we are not alone. Uh, whether you're a small civil society or you're a government agency, that there are amazing resources, um, uh, both regionally and also internationally, um, but also possibly even to connect to other resources that we didn't know about within our country itself. Um, so we will be... Um, you know, creating a mailing list for those that are, are be interested. Um, and as well as um, if 
feel free to send us more inputs, you know, at OGP at CNRproject.org. Um, so if you do feel that, you know, that we uh, possibly for more additional resources um, that you might want to have or connect with other partners, um, feel free to email us, uh, some of our speakers, and then we'll see how uh, we can connect with the wider OGP community. Um, other than that, um, do stay in touch. Uh, we'll um, post updates on our, um, on our social, through our social media platforms, um, as well as um, send an invite to an email to join our OGP discussion. Um, and we'll be launching an uh, OGP um, uh, coordination website um, next week so that we can get, um, so we, we can share all the existing initiatives and resources for all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think we can wrap our webinar today. So I would like to thank everyone for joining in. So we will compile all the slides and information and also on the chat as well. So we'll share with all the participants soon. So thank you guys. <laughs>